afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for coming. Today uh, we're going to talk about big data processing uh, for Hadoop and how we can use the Spring Project, Spring Data, batch and integration to help implement solutions for big data. So a little background. Uh, I have been a committer on the Spring uh, framework uh, starting in 2003, where I did some work relating to JMS. Uh, later on, went to found and lead the Spring.NET version of the Spring Framework. So Spring.NET is the uh, Spring Framework for the .NET platform. And then uh, three years ago or so, I uh, led up the uh, Spring Data project, which we'll hear more about in general. And <clears throat> there are many other members of the team, uh, not just myself, who work on the collection of projects uh, under the Spring Data umbrella. So in this uh, webinar, what I'd like to cover are three, three topics. A uh, brief overview of the data access landscape. As you know, there's been quite a lot of changes in the past six years or so in uh, data access. And talk uh, about Spring for Apache Hadoop. There was a webinar on this that you can check out if you go to the uh, Spring Hadoop homepage. Uh, but I'll do a little recap of some of the features we have there. And then I uh, want to really focus most and kind of drill home the point that uh, for d big data processing, uh, namely event stream processing and batch processing, you can use uh, spring data, batch, and integration together uh, to achieve uh, creating solutions in that space. So the background and motivation around spring data is really the changes that are happening in the data access landscape. It's been quite significant. Relational databases are still important and they're prevalent in the enterprise, but there are limitations that have been encountered in recent years as it relates to the use cases that people are trying to address. Uh, usually these limitations are in terms of scale um, and handling of semi-structured data. So a good portion of the data that people are trying to collect, in particular in the case of big data, um, is semi-structured. Therefore, it doesn't fit well up front to be classified in a relational schema. And the size of the data is quite large. Uh, we'll get into description of what large means. Uh, but suffice it to say, I don't think anyone attending this webinar thinks that you'll put a petabyte of data into Oracle anytime soon. So in reaction to the need to analyze and collect large amounts of information, uh, various data access technologies have emerged over the past uh, six years or so that are helping to solve these problems that relational databases can't. And of course they're addressing these limitations around performance and scalability, but also interestingly enough they very often come with additional data models. Uh, we've had sessions before on Spring Data as it relates to NoSQL, and in the NoSQL databases you have key value, column, document, and graph data structures and that might be a better match for your domain that you're trying to model. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, they also have different transactional semantics, uh, and those uh, expectations that you carry over from uh, sort of ACID-like semantics are really reflected now in a different acronym called uh, BASE, basically available um, <clears throat> with a relaxed consistency model, eventually consistent. So when creating a solution now in, in, in uh, big data, you will often combine a relational database or more than one other alternative technology, such as Hadoop or a NoSQL database, in combination in a solution. So this polyglot persistence, meaning it's not just only the relational database, is becoming a prevalent theme in solutions in the enterprise. So taking a look at enterprise uh, data trends, here's a survey that was done by IDC showing some numbers from 2009. And what we see here on the right is a red line that represents about 300 terabytes, which is the size of data that's stored in the Library of Congress. And we can see across different sectors in the uh, United States, uh, company sectors, uh, 15 out of 17 companies at the time of this survey were already storing more data than there was in the or there is in the U.S. Library of Congress. And if in particular you look at some of the sectors, like the security and investment services sector, it's considerably higher, almost four petabytes, at this time of the survey. 
Um, the type of data that's being stored here isn't sort of lar necessarily just large audio files or large video files, although that's predominant in the education sector, but it's actually semi-structured textual data that is the most common type of data that's being stored across all of these sectors. And the reason that there's a resurgence of interest in collecting information that otherwise used to spill on the floor is that the value that people or companies can derive from analyzing this data is now considerably greater than the cost of setting up the hardware and the software to collect and analyze this. So one example I, I commonly like to refer to because it appeared in sort of popular press was about orbits and how they analyzed the user agent header in the request made to their travel website. And they were able to determine that if you owned a Mac, you would be more likely or you would be more amenable to buying hotels or other airfare that were priced higher than if you weren't. And so these type of scenarios where uh, a data scientist, this is sort of a new term for people who analyze this data, can find ways to make a company more profitable uh, is a very direct connection and is why there's a lot of interest in this space. So as we know, Spring has always provided really great data access support from the beginning. There was always features such as the cloud of transaction management, portable data access exception hierarchies, helper classes such as JWC template, and integration and support for various ORMs such as Hibernate and JDO. Uh, most recently, uh, in Spring 3.1, for example, there was also new features related to data access in terms of declarative caching support. But in reaction to all the changes that were occurring in the data access landscape, the Spring Data Project was started with the basic idea that we should refresh Spring's data access support because of all these changes that were going on. And this covers not just um, relational databases, but NoSQL and big data as well. So <clears throat> the uh, benefits that Spring has often had associated with it carry over to the Spring data family of projects. These are the benefits around modularity, productivity, portability, and testability. So our mission statement was to provide a familiar and consistent Spring-based programming model across a range of technologies, notably big data, NoSQL, relational databases, and in particular, do this in a way that didn't over-abstract the uniqueness that is in each of these technologies. So while Spring is often thought to be a means to provide a common abstraction or um, a unique, uh, sorry, a, um, a common abstraction. In this case, you are usually picking these technologies for very specific features in that technology, and we didn't want to have a lowest common denominator approach. Instead, we wanted to be able to simply have a higher productivity experience uh, and access all the specific capabilities of that data store. So, big data. Uh, just to put a sort of working definition on it, is generally a moving and subjective target where we refer to data set sizes that are beyond the ability of traditional data management software to, to capture, store, and manage this. So of course we know the march of technology uh, makes us relative and what was big 10 years ago isn't particularly big now. Uh, but in today's terms, uh, a data set size of tens of terabytes or multiple petabytes is what I would consider to be the category of big data. So we've had previous webinars that cover the Spring family of projects as it relates to its relational support, uh, NoSQL support, and ways to access both relational and NoSQL databases with some common uh, uh, abstractions such as repositories and query DSL and REST. But today what we're going to uh, focus on is a bit of a review of what we have in the Hadoop project and then show how the extensions we've made into Spring Integration and Spring Batch allow you to implement big data solutions. So here we can see a view of a big data system. On the left-hand side, we have 
traditional sources of data that you might be collecting, such as files or messages off of a message queue system or a relational database. But increasingly, there's new types of data. For example, data coming from software as a service provider, such as Salesforce, or social streams, such as Twitter. And other data streams, for example, log files, sensors, uh, information from mobile devices. These are all being collected in what I would call a general integration app, where a series of steps normally takes place. You're transforming uh, the data that's coming in, potentially enriching it. You'd like to perform some real-time analytics on that stream. And here, the range of what I mean by real-time analytics could go from something as simple as incrementing counters that relate to, for example, how many times you see a hashtag in a tweet, or something much more complex, such as embedding a CEP engine, such as Esper, into the stream and getting very sophisticated uh, time-windowed averages or other queries answered as the stream is coming through. And why this is called the big data system is that eventually this stream of information or the data in these files needs to get into some unstructured data store. Uh, in this case, we're talking commonly about HTFS, but it could also be, for example, something like S3. Um, a blob store. Once you have data inside HDFS, the way you extract meaningful information from it is to write a batch job in the form of a MapReduce application. And that batch analysis occurs, and the results in turn are placed in some directory structure inside of this uh, HDFS data store. Those results are usually in turn taken out of HDFS and imported yet again into some structured database. For example, it could be MySQL, a relational database, it could be Mongo, or it could be R files for the uh, statistical software R. So that further churning and further analysis can happen, and that information is presented in turn to apps that end users interact with. So where the Spring projects can be used to help provide a solution is here in the middle, uh, where We'll get into how we can use Spring Integration, Spring Batch, and Spring Hadoop uh, to tackle the problems in that area. And so one of the fundamental assertions we are making is that big data problems are actually fundamentally integration problems. So the solutions that you'll need to implement usually require interaction across many different systems that you might have in-house. For example, as data is coming in, you might need to join that data with other reference data you have about your customers so that you can get a more complete picture of what's going on. And as a result, they share core components of what I would call a classic integration workflow, things that EI toolkits have been doing for, for ages. And so the solutions have elements that I would categorize in two basic camps, one around processing and one around analytics. So in the processing camp, you have event streams, and also you have batch workloads, such as a known set of files that you need to ingest. And the general scheme here in processing is to really move the data from its source, do some transformation on it and some filtering potentially, and then put it in some other place, for example, HDFS. On the analytics side, as the stream of events is being ingested, you might want to perform some real-time analytics. Like I said, this could be simple counters or something more complex. And once they're stored inside of HDFS, the analytics is the act of executing batch jobs, or in the case of Hadoop, MapReduce jobs, against the data stored in HDFS. So there are several Spring projects that offer quite a lot of integration functionality. The aptly named Spring Integration Project is useful for building up applications that are able to consume streams of events, and there are a variety of input and output adapters that you can use for this task. Spring Batch is very useful for performing ETL on data that you load from files, for example, and might want to move into a database, as well as orchestrating a general workflow of steps. And <clears throat> Spring Data Project has built a whole library of sort of spring-friendly helper classes that you can use to access a lot of NoSQL databases as well as data grids. 
And in particular, I'll spend some time summarizing some of the key features of Spring for Apache Hadoop. There was a previous webinar on this. I suggest you check it out if you want to dive into more of the details. But its goal is to basically simplify Hadoop programming and also provide integration with Spring Batch and Spring Integration so you can use Hadoop with those other projects to create an overall big data solution. So in this graph here, just sort of showing sort of in another way how integration is really an important part of big data. Around the edge of this circle, you have various components that you need to interact with in a solution. So as you're ingesting data, this might come from real-time streams, from mobile applications, potentially from batch files. These need to interact with enterprise applications and have their results stored in some unstructured data stores such as HDFS or S3. The analysis that then happens needs to be orchestrated. Potentially many steps of MapReduce jobs need to be, occur in a sequence. As you are ingesting, real-time analytics would occur. And at the end, you need to export the results of your MapReduce analytics into a relational database or maybe a NoSQL database. So Hadoop has emerged as a de facto standard around big data. And it consists of the following components. At the base level, there's a distributed file system called HDFS. And in this file system, you place copies of data, or the system places copies of data across different nodes, which makes it very resilient to failure. And the way you access or analyze the data that's stored inside of HDFS is to use the MapReduce framework by writing, for example, some Java code that will then get information from the file system, you perform some analysis on it, and usually write out the results back into HDFS. What we see here on top of the MapReduce layer is that in the course of writing lots of these MapReduce applications, people have found it's more productive not to write low-level Java code, which is the MapReduce framework, but higher-level programming languages have emerged, such as Pig and Hive, that offer you a query language of sorts that is a higher level and more productive experience. And we'll see a little bit of that later. Cascading is another one of those uh, higher level languages. It is written in Java as a Java DSL, but is higher level than the lower level MapReduce APIs. HBase is a column-oriented database that sits on top of HDFS, but allows for more real-time access to data stored in HDFS instead of the batch-style analytical way that you use with things that are sitting on top of the MapReduce framework. So there are a lot of sort of projects in the ecosystem, and we, we support all of these, uh, but that's sort of the lay of the land as it relates to Hadoop. So the goals of the Spring for Apache Hadoop project really center around what we view as this fundamental problem, which is that out of the box, Hadoop has a poor programming model, meaning that the way you are often suggested to write Hadoop applications is to have scripts that call command line utilities provided by Hadoop or other you know, projects in the Hadoop ecosystem. So the result is that you have a collection of scripts that also ends up potentially being like you know, a spaghetti script kind of situation. So what Spring tries to do here is provide a simplification to writing Hadoop applications by providing a structure. And in particular, a structure, of course, as Spring developers you'll be very familiar with and it's consistently done across all of the different ecosystem projects in Hadoop that actually individually have evolved uh, independently and actually have sort of very different looking fields. So we provide this solution across a wide range of Hadoop technologies, uh, HDFS, MapReduce, PIG, Hive Cascading, and HBase. And we cover a wide range of use cases that you can use, for example, to cover both the event stream and batch processing as well as the real-time analytics and batch analytics. And the other goal we've had inside of the Spring for Apache Hadoop project is that you should be able to start small with a small little Hello World MapReduce application, but then as your complexity or your needs grow, you can evolve into more sophisticated solutions. So here is a diagram that shows the relationship of Spring for Apache Hadoop to the other projects in the Spring ecosystem. So at the lowest level, you have the Spring Framework, where you have functionality such as dependency injection, messaging, and scheduling. So if you wanted to, for example, 
schedule a MapReduce job, all you need to use together are the Spring Framework and Spring for Apache Hadoop. If you somehow later decided, well, you know, I would like to actually not have this done through a scheduling mechanism, but have my MapReduce job launched in reaction to an event, you can bring Spring Integration into play so it can consume that event and in turn trigger a MapReduce job. Similarly, if you now wanted to have a more orchestrated workflow of steps where each step, for example, was one MapReduce job followed by another, you can then plug in the definition of the job you had at the lowest level when you're just using scheduling, for example, in the Spring Framework, and reference that in a larger Spring Batch orchestration. So that's what's sort of meant by starting small and growing up in complexity. And there are many use cases here, but that's just sort of one to highlight the path that you can take through uh, all the Spring projects with Hadoop. So what I'll get into now is a, a summary of uh, the features around the uh, Spring for Apache Hadoop project, and then you know, jump into sort of a higher level usage of creating uh, solutions that integrate all these various Spring projects. So the core capabilities are around declarative configuration. So you can use Spring's XML namespace for Hadoop to configure and parameterize the connectivity Hadoop, as well as all the different job types. By job types, I mean MapReduce, Cascading, Hive, and Pig. Uh, once you're inside the Spring container and have access to you know, all the richness configuration features that Spring container offers, things such as property placeholders or environment profiles, this allows you to provide structure on top of your application, for example, to facilitate moving your Hadoop application from dev to QA to prod. We'll see an example of that in a moment. And in the theme of developer productivity, um, because you're in a well-known structured environment, you're creating well-formed applications and not a collection of spaghetti scripts that call each other and have sort of an ad hoc scheme applied to their creation. The use of HDFS, we've uh, simplified this by providing a very nice uh, API that gives you access to commonly used commands that you would like to do with HDFS, uh, as well as making that amenable to uh, use inside of JVM scripting environments. For very small workflows, which usually involve simply HDFS operations, an analytical MapReduce operation or PIG operation, and then some subsequent HDFS operations, we provide some simple runner classes so you can encapsulate that common workflow very easily in a standard Spring app. There are also a series of template classes that you might be familiar with, you know, JDBC template and JMS template and so on, but for making interacting with PIG, Hive, and HBase programmatically, uh, more streamlined, more simple, more consistent. So here's an example that contrasts the, the difference in approach. So Hadoop tools are a standard way that Hadoop provides to packaging and running a uh, Hadoop MapReduce application. And the way if you would uh, launch this, if you were using plain Hadoop, is to go to the command line and type Hadoop jar and then pass in a bunch of arguments You'd pass in the configuration relating to how you'd like to connect to Hadoop, uh, the jar file, which class is the tool class, so to speak, or the main class, and then very often the input and output directories of where your data is sitting in HDFS and where you would like the results of the analytics you perform with MapReduce to be placed. So on the bottom here in this slide, what you see is an example of the Hadoop namespace, which you can use to specify how you connect the Hadoop with the configuration. And then we have a tool runner where you can then specify the jar, the arguments, and any other additional properties that are relevant for parameterizing the tool. So you can see now you have a very well-structured environment, and you can start to leverage a lot of the container features. For example, if you use property placeholders, here I'm reading in Hadoop-dev properties, which you see on the bottom, where I parameterize with a variable input.path and output.path the locations for input and output, as well as where I connect to HDFS. So in the top here, you see the HTTP configuration. I've inlined very flatly uh, key value pairs uh, and referenced a variable, you know, dollar per n HDFS, and similarly for input and output path. 
And on this slide here, you can also see the job runner. Uh, this is a class that implements Callable, actually. And here you can reference a job, and there's an optional way you can say start this job when the application starts. That's not the default, but then you could use, for example, I'll show you dependency injection to get a reference to this job and execute it at your convenience, maybe in reaction to an event you received on an MVC controller. So the commands you use on the command line to interact with HDFS are fairly um, similar to any other one you'd find in a file system. You can do ls, you can do make dir, you can do chmod and test and so on. And instead of using the command line to execute these operations, we provide a class that facilitates doing that programmatically. And in particular, we've, we've designed it to work well with the JVM scripting languages. So in this case, I'm showing you how we just want to copy some files, and we're basically testing to make sure that the input, local input directory uh, exists. Uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the directory in HDFS exists. Uh, if it doesn't, we make the directory, we copy from local file system into Hadoop, and then do some permission changes. And similarly, we can test if the output directory exists, and if it does, remove it, because Hadoop always likes to write to an empty output directory. So this script, this Groovy script in this case, uh, we have inside a file called copy files, and then we can in turn have this inside of our Spring application context and passing values to it in turn from, for example, property placeholders. As a, another example to show you know, just how you can use the richness of the Spring container, show an example of using what they call streaming jobs. This is how you can use MapReduce, but not with Java, but other um, languages, or in this case, we're using, uh, for word count, simple Unix utilities such as cat and wc to achieve the same uh, functionality as the word count example. And <clears throat> so instead of calling Hadoop jar and putting a streaming jar uh, uh, referenced and specifying input and output and so on, um, we can use the streaming element of the Hadoop namespace. But what I wanted to really get to in this slide uh, was less the streaming functionality, although that's nice, is that we can use its environment uh, variable support to pick up the $m environment variable from the command line, let's say, when we're launching this app. So when this m variable is dev, we read the Hadoop-dev properties. Uh, when it's changed to um, QA, uh, then we read the QA properties. So once you have a job defined, for example, with, with the namespace job, uh, you can then inject it as you would any other Spring Manage object, uh, change its runtime configuration, for example. And of course, uh, in the case of MapReduce, most likely you'd want to submit that job. So this gives you the flexibility to have references to uh, job objects and have them declared through dependency injection as you would any other type of uh, object you deal with when you're working with Spring. So I'd like to do a brief overview of some of the features in uh, Spring for Apache Doop as it relates to um, Pig and Hive. So what is Pig? Um, in addition to being a kind of weird name for a project, it's an alternative to writing a MapReduce application to help increase your productivity. So the language in which you use to write a Pig app is called Pig Latin, a little tongue-in-cheek there, obviously. And Pig Latin is a, is a high-level data processing language, more in the spirit of SED and awk, uh, not SQL, in where you have basically uh, a collection of data and you define a sequence of steps that performs different transformations on that data set, in turn getting new data sets. Uh, there's a pretty rich extensibility mechanism for what are called user-defined functions. A lot of your uh, custom logic usually sits in user-defined functions. And the way it fundamentally works is that this Pig Latin script is translated into underlying MapReduce jobs by a component called the Pig Server. So just as with the launching of MapReduce jobs, uh, the way you interact with Pig is to use the Pig command line in, in the standard way and pass in, let's say in this case, a reference to a, a word count Pig Latin script in addition to various properties. So what we've done here in Spring for Apache Hadoop is that you can use a namespace, which in turn defines this um, uh, pig server, 
And then you can reference you know, configuration properties for the pig server, as well as reference the script and any arguments you might need for the script. So once again, we've made this a more uh, programmatically accessible uh, approach than you would have if you were just dealing with um, the uh, pig command line. Or even the underlying pig APIs have improved uh, to do programmatic things, but they're not as consistent or I think as flexible as what we offer in terms of uh, Spring's take on it. Um, there's a pig runner class. Uh, much like the job runner, the pig runner lets you execute a small workflow. So for example, here we have the setup basically creating the pig server, and then a script that copies files into HDFS, and then we have the pig runner, which has this interesting feature of saying pre-action. This is where you get a little bit into this small workflow. It lets you execute one or more uh, HDFS scripts before running one or more scripts uh, in pig Latin. And then not shown here, there's also a post-action element, which lets you define HDFS operations or scripts that you would execute after the various pig Latin scripts executed. There, there's an optional run at startup attribute uh, that you can use uh, to run this when the application context boots. But pig runner, as well as hive runner and the others, we have uh, implement callable so that you can actually uh, inject it into your class and then use call to actually execute its functionality. So here we show. Uh, the pig runner in the context of leveraging Spring's rich scheduling support. So here we show a class that has the scheduled annotation and a cron expression, which would be interpreted by the Spring container to schedule the execution of this method according to that cron schedule. So walking through some of the features of Spring for Apache Hadoop's Hive support, uh, much like PIG, Hive is an alternative to writing MapReduce applications. Uh, it's written in a language called HiveQL that's more in the spirit of SQL. So if you see some SQL-like things, uh, you'll be more at home. Or if you're familiar with SQL, which I'm sure everyone is, you'll feel a little bit more at home out of the box with Hive. Uh, and much like in PIG, there's a server component that's responsible for translating this higher-level query language into one or more underlying MapReduce jobs. And because it's in the spirit of SQL, it probably comes as no surprise that you can access um, uh, uh, Hive through a JDBC or ODBC interface, as well as what was the more traditional way, which is an RPC mechanism using uh, Thrift. So to run a Hive script, the way you would do this in standard Hadoop is to actually call the Hive command line, pass in a script, and then pass in different options to run the application or different options of how you would like to uh, connect to, for example, the, um, the Hive server. Uh, with standard JDBC, what I show here is sort of ancient boilerplate code of how you would do that uh, using the Hive driver. So the first sort of lowest hanging fruit here is just simply to say, well, let's use JDBC template to access Hive. And so here is the simple recipe in which you can specify the Hive driver use Spring simple driver data source, and then pass that into JDBC template to access data uh, in, through Hive. <clears throat> what this means is you can then do things, for example, like query for long and pass in simple select statement, or execute queries and use either row mappers or result set extractors to map those result sets into a collection of POJOs. So a little stop through uh, HBase land before I get on to the bigger context of using uh, Spring integration in batch. Uh, HBase is a column-oriented database. Uh, what this means is instead of a typical key value database, uh, in the column-oriented databases, the value itself has rich structure. Often it's a key value pair itself. So you can sort of think of the data structure as a doubly, or sometimes they even have triply nested hash tables. And the structuring of these columns are usually done into groups called column families, and that's intended to group together data that you would access frequently. So it would store that information uh, co-located on disk, and this helps increase the IO throughput in order to access just the information you're most commonly reading. Uh, data gets stored in HDFS, and the whole scheme, much like uh, Hadoop, MapReduce, and HDFS itself, is modeled after technology that came out of Google, in this case, 
Google's big table. And you know, in terms of uh, you know, uh, what you need to do to bootstrap HBase, you usually need to define a very loose schema for the groups of data, call it column families. But inside each group, you have basically freedom uh, afterwards to add and, and remove any sort of arbitrary key value pairs that you want. So Spring's HBase support uh, consists of a namespace to help configure your connectivity to HBase, as well as an HBase template class, which handles some of the lower level resource management because the underlying API for accessing HBase, uh, the main class you do use to access it, the Hive client, is not thread safe. So we handle that resource management so you don't have to worry about creating a new Hive template, I'm sorry, a new Hive client per thread. Similarly, uh, its exception handling uh, could uh, use some improvement. So we provide uh, the wrapper that will convert those exceptions in Hive into Spring's portable data assets exception hierarchy. And it fits in quite nicely. Just in recent versions of HBase, they've added error codes that map very nicely into Spring's existing data access exception hierarchy. For example, is this a transient data access exception, in which case you know, repeating it uh, would potentially yield success, or is it something more fatal? Uh, as HBase sort of mimics uh, SQL in many ways, in terms of their table type structures, uh, we provide uh, mapping that uses familiar concepts such as role mapper and results extractor in order to map your queries from Hive back into POJOs. And as always, with any of the template classes, you can call the execute method and get access to the lower level resource, in this case, uh, that's through a table callback, and you get access to the underlying table class in a thread-safe manner. So this just shows some boilerplate configuration you'd have in Spring to connect to first Hadoop, and then in turn use that to bootstrap configuration to HBase, and pass that into an HBase template. This just shows a quick example if we were doing essentially a select all from a column family called info, and what we'd like to do in each result object that's in a collection, we iterate over it much like um, happens in the JDBC case, and use a row mapper to take that particular row and get values to create a new POJO, in this case a user class. And you can see that the uh, way you interact usually with uh, the data that's coming out of uh, HBase is in the form of bytes, and so there's conversion steps that you have to do there through these helper classes to convert bytes into a particular data type, in this case, string. So moving on to, this, to sort of the bigger theme around big data processing, um, Spring Integration and Spring Batch uh, are very useful for these two training solutions that cover these two kind of coarse categories of uh, processing data meaning event streams, so this maps very well into Spring integrations. For example, we can consume syslog events, transform them, and then write them into HDFS. Spring batch, in the case of not consuming, let's say, a never-ending event stream, we can process log files that sit on a local file system, transform, process them, and write that information into HDFS. Similarly, we can point Spring batch to files that are in HDFS, because it is a file system, transform and then in turn write that information into JDBC, HBase, MongoDB, and so on. In terms of analytics, the Spring Integration project can be used to create service activator components that perform real-time analytics, something as simple as incrementing counters in Redis or MongoDB which you can use very easily inside, uh, leverage the, the Spring Data projects that are in uh, uh, for Mongo or Redis that make these kind of one-liners. Uh, similarly for Gemfire Data Grid, that's sort of an intermediate step maybe, there's a functionality called continuous queries in which the query you specify is continually evaluated as events come in to find those that satisfy the query uh, criteria. Uh, or you could be even more complex and embed a CEP engine such as Esper to perform more sophisticated time windowing activities. As it relates to uh, batch style analytics, here we can use Spring Batch now to orchestrate Hadoop based workflows where each step in the Spring Batch application is actually executing a pig or a hive uh, job 
and then those are chained together into a sequence. So here I'll go through a series of sort of recipes. Uh, all of these recipes, I think maybe except one, are available as uh, examples in a GitHub repository that come um, with uh, that were created as a result of um, examples inside of the Spring Data uh, book that's available. I'll give a reference to all of these uh, at the end of the webinar. So from the ingestion point of view of how do you get data into HDFS, one example we can pick is syslog into HDFS. Spring integration now has a, a syslog adapter. And for example, syslog has categories in it. That's sort of the schema around the syslog message. And then in Spring integration, you can use, for example, that category in the message to transform, uh, sorry, to route to different channels based on category. Uh, maybe we'll have one route where all messages go and get written into HDFS, but only a filtered set of category messages might get stored into Redis. And what I show here is sort of this flow. Um, this is the visualization you get from using Spring integration inside of uh, the Spring Source tool suite. Uh, it's a visualization of the underlying uh, Spring Integration XML, uh, where we're taking information in, we're doing some transformation, and then you know, having uh, uh, the data go to HDFS outbound uh, adapter, as well as then going through into a, a filter where the subsequent output goes into Redis. What's nice about Spring Integration in particular is channel abstraction is that anywhere you have a channel in Spring Integration, you can think of that as a seam point in which you can then have processing that occurs on the left side of the channel occur in a separate JVM from the processing that happens in the right side of the channel. And the way you would make that happen is to insert a pair of outbound and inbound adapters. So in this case, I've split the flow from uh, the syslog into a collection part that can occur on one or more JVMs, and that's what's shown here on the left-hand side. Uh, I'm collecting syslog information. It's going into a TCP outbound adapter, and these are collectively being um, aggregated in a third JVM, which is following the same flow of processing as before. Uh, here I show the use of uh, TCP, but you can use other adapters for other types of middleware. And it's also important to know that you can have the uh, TCP adapter use a uh, channel that's backed by a persistent storage. So essentially what you get here are store and forward semantics, in which case the message that comes from syslog is first stored into disk, for example, and then forwarded to the other side uh, across uh, TCP. When the acknowledgment from TCP happens in the receiving end, the uh, sender then deletes that message from the underlying uh, uh, data storage. So a more complex example here, what I'd like to show is how you can set up a scheme in which you can copy either uh, local files or, for example, even remote files that are sitting on an FTP site um, into HDFS, and then use Spring Aggregators component to specify a completion criteria in which you'll say, well, every hour I'd like to now launch a new MapReduce job on all the files that I've collected over the past, uh, past hour. So this, again, is just showing an example using the tooling that's available in the Spring Source Tool Suite to visualize that flow. Here I'm showing polling using the inbound um, file adapter. And then I'm copying uh, those files uh, from uh, that area to some staging area into HDFS, and then waiting in an aggregator to, to um, process those files, uh, waiting uh, for the completion to happen every hour. And then because MapReduce jobs are now just another spring managed component, it's very easy to incorporate uh, that into the overall flow. So this is just a schematic of how you might do more complex real-time analytics uh, using spring integration. Here I'm showing uh, ingestion using the inbound HTTP adapter. And this goes into a channel and then is transformed. And maybe one pathway for the data is to then go into Esper, uh, where you can then, if you want, look at the uh, Open Credo uh, c company that has made integration adapters for um, Esper. Uh, in turn, it could go into Gemfire. And there are a couple features here you can use a data grid for. It doesn't necessarily have to be Gemfire. Uh, one is uh, um, 
uh, functionality, which I would call a data capacitor, which is imagine HDFS goes down for some reason, or you're collecting data at a higher rate than you can write into HDFS. The distributed data grid is a sort of great staging area to batch that information and insert it into HDFS. Uh, similarly, you might not just want to get data into HDFS, but maybe another database that has high scaling characteristics such as Greenplum, in which case you can have this input stream send information uh, through, uh, say, a filter, and then that information goes into a more traditional uh, database, but still one that's uh, highly scalable and distributed. So another scenario that comes up is how do you ingest data that's inside uh, JDBC, a relational database, and get that into HDFS. Uh, this is actually a fairly straightforward uh, application of Spring Batch, uh, where you use Spring Batch's JDBC item reader, and then we have an uh, implementation for the uh, item writer that lets you write into uh, HDFS and roll files over and you know, specify the naming of those files and the directory. Uh, that you'd like to use. But at the high level, what you have is a spring batch step. The processing in a spring batch step is represented by a component called a tasklet. And here we're going to process the chunks of data uh, in groups of 100 and get those groups of 100, you know, depending on how many you have in total, uh, into to HDFS. So you have the reader, you have in this case a processor, and then a writer. And what's shown here in terms of uh, the command interval and the retry limit is to sort of give hints that the functionality that's available in Spring Batch is, is actually quite rich. The retry limit is just sort of one example of how you can have uh, sort of controlled resiliency in this process. So uh, retry limit of three indicates that if there's any issue in this sort of little chain here, we'll try this up to three times before failing the job. And there, there's a whole series, in fact, I'd say, a large part of the functionality is actually in Spring Batch around how to handle error conditions versus the sunny day scenario. So you can check out uh, you know, the standard Spring Batch documentation uh, from or books to, to find out more information on that. And that all applies uh, to this case of writing into HDFS as well, including things such as uh, you know, scaling out through um, uh, partitioning and uh, multiple threads. So this shows a, a first snapshot of how we've integrated uh, executing batch analytics that are performed in Hadoop, but orchestrated through Spring Batch. Spring Batch fundamentally has a job launcher that launches a job, and a job consists of a series of steps. And those steps can be actually fairly complex in their structure. They can be sort of any arbitrary uh, graph. and <clears throat> In this case, what I'm showing on the bottom side uh, of this diagram is that these steps could be, for example, copying files in HDFS. They could be executing analytics in the form of pig jobs. I'm showing here a branch in which now there's a parallel execution, a split, where simultaneously a MapReduce job and a Hive job are being executed. And only when they both complete do I continue to the next step, in this case, an HDFS operation. What I show here in this uh, uh, picture is Spring Source Tool Suite's visualization of that flow on the left-hand side where I do an import, word count, a pig operation, and then, then a parallel operation uh, for MapReduce and Hive. On the right-hand side is the underlying uh, XML that you would author in order to construct that flow. And if you take a look, for example, at the step which is related to uh, the word count tasklet, I can see here that the word count task in turn is referencing a job, and that job shown below is the same job namespace that you would have used when you were just sort of getting to uh, started with, with Spring for Apache Hadoop and referencing, for example, a simple job in a basic Spring application that you know, was sort of your hello world. So this is an example of what I mean by saying you can have a simple starting point, namely uh, bootstrap, you know, your connectivity to Hadoop in Spring, specify a simple job, but later incorporate this inside of a uh, larger workflow. And similarly, there's corresponding tasklets for Hive and for Pig and so on. 
So in the case of exporting data, uh, we might want to get HDFS into local files. There are several ways you can kind of tackle this. Uh, one is to use our helper class FS shell. Uh, so here we have a script, and I've actually inlined the script inside of the XML. You know, it looks a little nasty, but this is just a one-liner. And here I'm uh, using uh, Groovy as a language. I parameterize the, the source and destination, and then just call the utility method copy to local. So once I have this script, I can use the script task with to reference it and execute it as maybe the last step in a long batch workflow. Uh, another mechanism is that Spring Batch fires events when, when jobs or steps end, and you can have something listening to that uh, and reacting. For example, a Spring Integration component might be listening uh, and reacting. Uh, similarly, you can have Spring Integration polling, uh, HDFS directories, uh, and then taking action once there's something present, in this case, you'd probably execute uh, FS shell again once the presence of a file in HDFS was detected. So another exporting scenario, this is um, actually quite easily addressed with Spring Batch, where you can have uh, a file reader or a multi-file item reader pointing into HDFS. So this is uh, leveraging just the standard file system semantics that Spring already supports. Uh, we have a small item processor here, and then we use the standard JDBC item writer to write that information into um, a relational database. And again, all the sort of scaling characteristics that there are in uh, Spring Batch apply here uh, just as well. Uh, we've written uh, these sit in the examples uh, uh, repository, but we'll move into Spring Batch proper. Uh, uh, item writer uh, based on Mongo. Uh, and here's a nice example of where we were able to leverage the Spring Data Mongo project to very easily write uh, item writer. It's really uh, just one or two lines of code, and it's a batched item writer. There's functionality in Mongo itself that's exposed through Mongo template, which allows you to take a collection of messages and then have those in one shot be written out into the Mongo database. So the main resources that you can go for constructing solutions of this type uh, is the, uh, the Spring Data landing page that has all the projects, more specifically the Spring for Apache Hadoop page, where you can see a link to the webinar that goes into more detail about the Spring for Apache Hadoop project. And the examples that I've shown here of how you can create these larger solutions are all inside this GitHub location Spring Data book. There's about, I think, 12 or so examples, a dozen, um, that show these various workflows and various combinations. Uh, there's a smaller, uh, in terms of content, repository on GitHub called Spring Data Kickstart, where you can get some very basic Maven archetype uh, applications, uh, shells, really, uh, to get started. So for more information, uh, there's three chapters on this topic in the, the Spring Data book, so sort of blatant plug here, the O'Reilly one. Uh, the more general theme of other topics covered in Spring Data are covered in the O'Reilly book as well, in addition to another book uh, from Packet. And the links here you see um, are ones you can use to get linked to the book, as well as a, a promotion we're offering uh, where you can get a, a chapter for free, and that relates to uh, Spring Data's uh, JPA technologies. Okay, so um, that's uh, it for the slides. Uh, I see that Kostin has been quite busy uh, diligently answering questions. I don't know if there's a few left that you guys and gals want to ask. Um, I'll just hang out here for the next, you know, five or ten minutes and um, take your questions and then uh, <clears throat> let's see. Someone's saying the... Uh, <laughs> the Spring Hadoop page is not uh, working. That, that's sort of weird. Oh, I see. <clears throat> it's Spring Data Dash Hadoop. Did I put the wrong URL up there? Yeah, I did. Oops. Sorry, guys. My bad. <laughs> that was a typo. So, yeah, the URL is uh, springsource.org slash spring dash data slash Hadoop. Same thing for Mongo, then it would be Spring Dash Data Mongo, DB, and so on. Let's take a look. Well, you guys asked a lot of questions. I hope you got good answers.
Yeah, it looks like it. Uh, there's a question here. Uh, oh, the, my world's most favorite question. Any update on supporting Cassandra? Uh, I wish I could say yes, but uh, right now we don't have that on our roadmap. Uh, uh, we welcome lots of contributions, but uh, at the moment we have our hands full with our current uh, staff basically uh, handling the uh, dozen or so uh, projects in spring data. But that is the you know, number one uh, uh, data store we'd get to next uh, should we have sufficient bandwidth. Um, go back to the previous slide with the links. Yeah, but the links are wrong. I mean, uh, <clears throat> we have... Uh, Spring Data is the right one on the top, but the other one should be uh, Spring Data uh, slash Hadoop. Uh, but the, the example GitHub repos are, are accurate. Uh, there's a, another question here. Uh, what version of Spring uh, supports Spring Hadoop? Uh, I guess Kostin is in the middle of uh, answering that. Uh, so 3.0x is the lowest version and uh, recommending using a 3.1. Uh, in addition, uh, Kostin has done some great work recently on setting up our continuous integration infrastructure to test uh, Spring for Apache Hadoop against uh, uh, various distributions, about four or five of them. So another question is, batch jobs for JVC, HDFS, and vice versa, transfer leverage Flume, Scoop, or how they differ from the Apache stuff? So what we're suggesting here is that, for example, for ingestion using Spring integration, it's an alternative to Flume. Similarly, uh, an alternative to using Scoop. Uh, you can use Spring Data. The one difference we have, or distinction, for example, in uh, Scoop, is that we don't support yet the execution of um, the jobs that, that, for example, copy data out of HDFS into relational database on the Hadoop cluster itself. It's something we can get to, but uh, we don't support that particular scenario yet. So uh, you would have to scale out um, using uh, multiple threads assigned to different files in HDFS. Uh, or um, uh, the partitioning scheme. So there's probably a performance penalty there. It really, I guess, depends on um, how much data you have. And you know, we're aware of these uh, uh, optimizations or improvements that you can make uh, to it. And sort of, you know, we're on um, the journey to, to completing that picture and really providing one set of technologies that can address all of these together instead of really actually projects that evolved completely separately uh, and have different uh, ways to configure and operate them. Um, what is the roadmap for Spring Apache Hadoop? Is there a strong commitment to this module yet? Uh, yes, uh, we've been working on it for about a year, so there's a very strong commitment to it. And um, the Spring for Apache Hadoop uh, module is inside actually the Greenplum Hadoop distribution. Uh, that's distributed by EMC. And they're quite committed to it. And uh, the GA for it, uh, we've been, uh, like I said, over the year uh, getting feedback and, and releasing different versions, um, should be happening uh, early uh, Q1 2013. Um, trying to see some other questions. Let's see. Um, and to ensure repeating resume on the job once a hit exception happens. So the uh, Spring Batch framework, every step uh, that you have defined there, you can specify uh, if that step should be repeated in case the flow stops uh, because of an exception, for example, that you fix the cause of that exception. So uh, the sort of standard Spring Batch semantics here around stopping and uh, starting uh, are already uh, there. Um, what's another example here? Are the, I'm not sure I understand this question, are the callbacks at the very basic level based on polling of data? I don't know which uh, Vikram, I don't know which technology you're talking about here, the callbacks. Uh, there's a question, does Spring Security integrate with these tools already? Um, so, <clears throat> for example, trying to think of scenarios here, uh, you know, we support the, the Hadoop security uh, in that respect, but uh, Spring Security 
uh, in terms of using it in the context of spring batch uh, or spring integration. Um, you know, spring integration has support for using uh, spring security. Uh, if you're writing an MVC application, of course, you can secure that with uh, spring security. So the um, <clears throat> combination of the Spring Security Library really depends on the application uh, you're building. But of course, you know, if you're using uh, other projects in the Spring ecosystem, you can expect to have a pretty good experience uh, applying Spring Security to those apps. Uh, question, if the batch job uh, stops, the batch job stops, it will stop the node execution, right? So you know, what's happening here is um, uh, Actually, it's a good question. I don't think what we do when we stop it, hmm, good question. I don't know if we send a cancel message to uh, that job. Costin actually might know uh, the answer to that question, Raja. <clears throat> I think he's in the process of uh, answering that. So uh, what's the advantage of the Hadoop regular scripting language over Bash, Shell, C Shell, etc.? Well, I mean, you know, obviously you can bind, you know, a solution that uses both if you really wanted, but I think the, the advantage is you have all the complete flexibility of an API inside of a rich programming language to interact with HDFS, and you don't need to um, shell out uh, in your application in order to just do some very clean and simple uh, HDFS command. So, so the theme we have going here is that we want to make Hadoop more programmatically accessible instead of having to continually call out and write large scripts that do things. If you prefer using scripts, uh, you, know, you can do that too. We're sort of offering an alternative. Have you tested Spring Data Tools with Hadoop running on Google Compute Engine? Excellent question. If uh, Google ever gets back to my request to have a um, account, we'll test it there. But they haven't gotten back yet. So if anyone has any contacts in Google, maybe you can ping them. I mean, just to, to um, elaborate a little bit more on uh, uh, Kinchuk's question, you know, why would you want to use uh, you know, a programmatic API for HDFS versus Bash and Shell? I mean, if you're making a decision of some operation to do in HDFS based off of some business logic, uh, you quite likely will have that business logic very easily available in some form of Java code or Groovy code and not... Uh, inside of a shell environment where you maybe have to make some sort of, you know, request to an HTTP endpoint and process the results and then put the conditional branching inside of a shell script. So <clears throat> I showed basically straight up simple scripts, but you can do anything you want there, right? Like <clears throat> the same applies uh, to, to, to executing pig scripts. Maybe, you know, sometimes I want to execute two, three, four, five pig scripts and not just one. So I have better programmatic control, I can do that in a more structured way that obviously Java developers are certainly familiar with. Okay, it's uh, 2.04. I think we had a good amount of questions. I really appreciate uh, everyone attending today. And uh, please get in touch with us through the forums or through JIRA about your experiences and any other questions you have. Again, thanks for uh, your participation today. And um, yeah, see you around. Bye.